81% of Americans, according to the New York Times, want to write a book. Less than 1% do every year. I don't believe in writer's block. I believe in idea bankers. My business is built off the strength of my ideas. If you are casual about your ideas, you will write a crappy book. So the first step is you gather ideas. And a great easy way to do that is to say, what's a question that won't leave me alone? Can we talk about the process of writing books? Totally, of course. Yeah, love that. Like you said, I mean, that's what I do. Because we know that 81% of this audience probably wants to write a book. Yep. Um, and then unless we help them, only 1% actually will. So let's yeah, help. Yeah, it's a big gap. It's a huge gap. Yeah, yeah anything I can do to help. Let's help them. So like, so for, so, so yeah, maybe, maybe, t maybe talk us through like the process. You have an idea. You, you, you pick mm -hmm. a problem you're going to take on. And it seems like, again, your books are pretty tactical. You pick a problem yeah. and you go at it. Yeah. So, I mean, here's the, the, the first step is you gather ideas. Um, I don't believe in writer's block. I believe in idea bankruptcy. I never sit down to a blank piece of paper without ideas. So the first step is you gather ideas. And a great easy way to do that is to say, what's a question that won't leave me alone? So there's a question, there's a challenge. We're talking nonfiction. If you want to write a book about dragons and it's an epic tale with love right. and romance, like <laughs> I'm not going to help you much because I've never done that. If you want to write an illustrated children's book, I've never done that either. There's a great temptation when you're you know, online or you have a podcast or whatever to be like, I can answer any question. I can't, dude. If you ask me about a dragon book, I got nothing. I know <laughs> I read them sometimes. I don't know how to write them, but right. I'm talking a nonfiction a book, you find a question that won't leave you alone. And then you start to gather ideas and you just go through this idea gathering process. Um, and you gather a bunch of ideas, so many ideas. I have a notebook I have right now. I've had 782 ideas this year because I keep a numbered list. And so I curate ideas. My business is built off the strength of my ideas. If you are casual about your ideas, you will write a crappy book. And mm -hmm. that's just the reality. So I'm serious about my ideas and I'm listening the best definition of creativity, in my opinion, was by Dorothy Parker, a writer from, her, from the 60s. And she said, creativity is a wild mind and a disciplined eye. The wildness is you fill your head with all these different ideas, something that Jeff said on a podcast, something your kid asked, the way a commercial was written, um, you know, a word used on a menu that surprised you. You collect, 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 wild mind. And then you have the discipline of your eye to see the connections between them. So that's how I'm doing it. So I'm collecting ideas and collect, you know, filling up this kind of idea collection. And then I start to look for patterns. Then I go, okay, which of these are related? Which of these are cousins? Could I clump some of these? And then eventually could I evolve these to chapters? Okay, what could I, you know, can I see a through line? Can I see a thread between these ideas? I have a, I have a fairly good outline. It's not a perfect outline writers get lost in the outline. They say, Jeff, as soon as I'm done with my outline, then I can start writing. No, 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 no. They're parallel processes. You do the outline with the book as you're writing, as you're writing, as you're writing. If you wait until the outline is perfect to start, you'll never start. So that's kind of my beginning process is the ideas, the relationships, the patterns, they evolve the chapters, they evolve to a through line. And then there's a outline running parallel to that. So, well, I'm going to give you a, a self-serving answer. Well, I'm, it's self-serving for you to give to others that the way they should write a book is first they should read your book, Start. <laughs> they're inspired to start. And then yep. they should go do it and get all frustrated and not finish it. And then they should read your book, Finish. Exactly. And that'll get them, that'll get exactly. them over the line, right? Beginning to end. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. You're, you're an end-to-end -end solutions provider. And, and we appreciate that about you. Oh, good. Good. <laughs> um, okay, so... No, in all seriousness, um, yeah, I'm curious then any, uh, any other tips you would give to some, we don't have to spend this whole time talking about the book process, but any other tips or kind of big takeaway lessons you've learned the hard way on what it really takes to get a book done? Yeah, I mean, you need, like you said, you've got a deadline in 12 days, you need deadlines. If you don't have deadlines, mm -hmm. you'll never finish it. But that's true of any goal, um, you know, whether that's a weight loss goal, whether that's a business goal, you need deadlines, you need to be time boxed. Because um, a book is never done, it's turned in. And that's there's a distinction. 
Like you could write that book forever. When mm. somebody tells me they've been writing a book for 10 years, it means they don't have deadlines. So I think leaning on deadlines. And if you don't have deadlines because you don't have a publishing deal yet, creating your own deadlines, getting some accountability from other people, making some deadlines, not waiting for somebody else to give them to you. Um, it's great if you have a publisher. Awesome. That What a privilege to have somebody who's interested mm. in publishing your work. Um, but a lot of times you don't have a publisher until you've written the book. So you've right. got it like deadlines really matter. Yeah, that's huge. Yeah, no, that from my own experience, I would have had this done much sooner if somebody had had made oh, yeah. me or I had just made myself. Yeah, totally. I always think it's so interesting how people that that operate in the realm of self improvement, how they got into it, right? Because like nobody majors in that in school. No. Yeah. Um, how'd you end up doing what you're doing? Oh, that's a really good point, Jeff. Um, for me, uh, the the big shift was figuring out that I was stuck. Um, in my early 30s, I had kind of plateaued in my career, and my wife kind of helped me see that. I was a um, copywriter, but they called it senior content designer because that sounded better. And there was no super duper senior content designer position above that. So in my early 30s, I had topped out career wise, and that was humbling. It was humbling, it was scary, it was confusing. I mean, you think you'll top out in your 50s or later mm -hmm. on in life, but I topped out and thought, okay, I need to try something else. I need to try some side hustles, some experiments. And so that's really what I started to do. And I started to write online. I started to share ideas. I started to write about being stuck. And a lot of other people felt that same way. And so that got me interested in, okay, self-development, personal development, self-discipline, productivity as a solution to a problem I had. And then I kind of turned and said, does anyone else have this problem? I think that when it comes to best-selling ideas, whether that's for a book, a podcast, a course you're going to do, a business you're going to launch, there's always three things you're looking for. Um, this is kind of my Venn diagram of, of a best-selling idea. One is a personal connection. Am I personally connected to this? Because you're going to talk about it for years and years and years and years. Right. Two is the people need it. Are people, you know, podcast listeners, are people in my neighborhood, people at the neighborhood pool, people online, people I'm speaking to, they actually need it. And then third is, is there a spot for me in the marketplace? And so take the book finish. You mentioned I was a chronic starter and an inconsistent finisher. And I was tired of that. I had all these half done things. I wanted to be better at finishing. So I had a personal connection and then people actually needed it. I wrote a book called Start and people came up to me and said, hey, I like your book Start, but no offense, I've never had a problem starting anything. I can start a thousand things tomorrow. Like every entrepreneur has a hundred terrible URLs registered at GoDaddy wow. just in case. And so I was like, wow, there's a need. And then I went to Amazon and checked my marketplace. And if you type in finish into Amazon, the first thing that comes up is dishwasher detergent because we as a culture celebrate the beginning and we ignore the finish. So I thought, wow, I've got those three things. And I always tell people, if you find something you're passionate about and it's not being served in the market, but nobody needs it, that's a hobby. Like, I love that you're into ferrets. That's awesome, dude, that you're yeah. like, you know, you love albino ferrets and you want to do a store in Ohio and, you know, the market isn't serving that. But if nobody needs it, it's a hobby. If you find something that you go, wow, there's a need, there's a market, but you're not passionate about it, you just created yourself another day job. Like you might make money on it, it might be successful, but you're going to be unhappy. And the third one is if you find something that you go, wow, like I'm passionate, people need it, but it's already overserved, that's a cake pop. If you told me today, John, I got this crazy idea, I'm going to do cake pops, I'd go, oh, Jeff, I have terrible news. Like those have been out for like 15 years. By the time it's at Starbucks, you've missed that moment. Right, so right. that's kind of how I got into personal development was I had challenges in my own life that I wanted to figure out. And then I saw that there's a bigger need. And then I saw that there's a spot for me in the marketplace. And once those three things lined up, I started to create. Man, you just nailed to a T how I got into entrepreneurial education. Mm -hmm. I mean, I was passionate about telling people what was possible for their life if they would take the risk to start their own jam. And I was the person who solved the problem for me of being psychologically unemployable and disobedient to authority. So I couldn't have a job. Yep. Uh, timing worked out pretty well with the great resignation. Yeah. You know, although I started it in 2018, but um, yeah, I mean, you, and, and the, yeah, you just, you, you just called it. So for anybody that's got a big idea, and a lot of my audience does. Oh, totally. That's who's listening. Yeah. John just gave you the formula right there. Well, awesome. What's so fun. I mean, I think that's what's fun about conversations like this is there's a lot of overlap between what we do. And so yeah. 
I think we can bounce back and forth and go, what about this? What about that? So that's always fun for me. So, so, okay. So you started, uh, are you senior? And by the way, also, I just have to say senior content designer was you for me. It was like gigging piano player. I was 26 years old in Houston, Texas. And I realized I had basically reached the top of the food chain for gigging piano players in Houston, Texas. And I could go to LA and try to bet it all on, I don't know, maybe one direction needed a keyboard player or something. Well, but that's still just another small ladder that you're eventually going to climb to the top of. So you go, okay, what, you know, even if you move to LA, it's not like there's a thousand rungs to that ladder. Like you recognize, okay, like, Although, although there's a thousand people for every rung. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's a pretty crowded ladder too. I mean, you yeah. talk about marketplace. So yeah, I, that's, it's so funny. You had a similar experience in a completely different field. I think that's true of a lot of industries and a lot of individuals where they go, "Uh Oh, I just hit a ceiling. What am I going to do about it? Am I going to yeah. accept it? Am I going to try to push through it? Am I going to get on a different ladder? I think a lot of people get there. So when did you first decide you were going to take your, your writings or your musings and, and graduate from you know, blogging and articles and whatever to actually writing a book. When did that happen? Yeah. So in 2008, I had a blog that gained some traction and some momentum. Um, and I started to really pour into it. Uh, Seth Godin's book, the dip was a big book for me. It really clarified some things, you know, and short and powerful. And so I really leaned into this, this idea about writing online. And from there I got my first publishing deal. And what was funny was I got paid $30,000, which is awesome. But after taxes and agent fees, it's $13,000. And people would come up to me and go, oh, now you're going to quit and move to Mexico? And like, right. if you won a $13,000 lottery, no one would go, oh man, now you can retire. Right. And so it was a stepping stone to go, okay, let me keep trying this. And then it was other things like, I wrote about this in Soundtracks. Somebody reached out to me, an event planner said, hey, would you come speak at our event? And this was, you know, years and years and years ago. And I didn't even know that was a thing. This is 2008. That's, you know, 13 years ago. And I said, I think I can do that. All I had was a thought. I didn't have any proof. I didn't have any evidence yet. Um, But I took all these thoughts and I turned them into a bunch of actions and I turned them into a bunch of results. And that's always how, you know, mindset goes. Your thoughts become your actions, become your results. So that was really where it started to shift when I started to go, wow, there's a ton of opportunity if you're willing to work for it. There's a ton of opportunity if you're willing to be brave and make some mistakes publicly often, like, well, let me jump in and see what happens. And then I kept doing that bit by bit by bit, but it wasn't, there was no like overnight moment, obviously. But I, I mean, I remember one day I did an event with John Maxwell and we were doing a book signing together after, and his line had like a hundred people in it and mine had nobody in it. And I just remember thinking like, this is part of that. This is part of that process. Like this mm-hmm. is part of that. And somebody patted me on the back and said, 10 years, buddy, 10 years. And I remember thinking like, I think it's going to take longer than 10 years but it's worth doing. And so I found something that I felt like was worth doing. And then I was willing to pay the cost again and again and again and again. And it was fun. And so when, well, when was that? When did you write your first book? My first book came out in 2010. Um, 2010. Okay. And you've written seven. Yep. Seven total. I've got, um, I've got another one that'll come out next fall. And then another one the fall after that. So I'm in the middle of the, the next two right now. Cool. Now, well, I will, first of all, I'll just say this as somebody who's been on and on again, off again, writing a book for the last three years. And I have, you know, an actual deadline for my publisher to have the final manuscript to him in 12 days, 12 days uh, from now, from now. Yeah. Woo! From the time all right. This, it'll You're be- in the heat of it, dude. You're in the yeah. heat of it. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I, I respect, I mean, people say, Oh, I wrote a book. Like it's really flipping hard to actually write a book. Not it's here's the thing. It's not just to write a book. It's to write a book and be okay that that's the book. Yeah, yeah. No, it's challenging. It's hard for me to write books. I find it very hard. I mean, I think the muscle's gotten better the more I've done it. Like anything else, repetition Mm -hmm. creates muscle memory. But no, I find it very challenging. I mean, that's why one of the most popular goals in America people say they want to do is write a book. 81% of Americans, according to the New York Times, want to write a book. Less than 1% do every year. So it's very popular to say it. It's very hard to do it. And I think that a lot of people get stuck in the middle. A lot of people have an idea. Um, But as far as like, if somebody's listening right now is like, I want to write a book. Here's what I'd say. Write the first book. Don't call it the book. We put all this pressure on something that's already hard. And we go, 
I got to write this book to show my dad that my career choices were worth it. Whoa. Like that's good. You've just crippled yourself with additional pressure. Write a book. Don't go the book. Cause it put, creates all this fear and you're never going to finish it. Cause you, the closer you get to finishing a book, the more new ideas you find. And yeah. so you have to say no, like in day 13, if we're 12 days away from your book being due on day 13, you're going to have so many ideas that you're going to be tempted to put into this book. And you have to go, no, 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 no. That ship has sailed. That's for the next book. All you ideas that just showed up, you get to go on the next book. So fortunately, Jeff gets to write more than one book. Let's go. So that's part of the process where I think people get stuck. That's so true. Yeah. Well, I can tell you it's not waiting until the very end because, yeah, I'm already just like, should have said this, need to say that. When it really, it's like, no, actually, Jeff, you need to go back and finish what's already there. Totally. Totally. Not heap more. How many words is the book going to be? Uh, I think we're, we were targeting 65,000 and I think we're closer to 75. That's a big I'm book, a, dude. That's a big book. Yeah. yeah which congrats. Okay That's with. awesome. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's, it's, it's a legit book and, and here, and it's a timely book, but anyway, we're not here to talk about my book. Um, we'll talk about your books. <laughs> you write a book and then you don't like immediately, it's like having a baby or something. You don't mm -hmm. immediately get to work. Well, maybe you do. I don't know. Get to work on having, making the next baby the day after, but <laughs> Um, it, uh, the metaphor hopefully doesn't hold with a book. You don't, you don't publish a book and then the very next day start writing yeah. your next book. Right. Mm -hmm. So what's your life like? Like you yeah. write books mm -hmm. and then until you're writing the next one, what are you doing all day? Well, so, I mean, I do really two things. I write books and I go talk to companies about the books. So, you know, last, last, in the last two weeks, I was in Salt Lake city, um, Vegas, um, Los Angeles, um, did some events in Nashville, Lynchburg, Virginia. So the fall, I do a lot of speaking and some of them are virtual, but I'd say 80% are live again, which is awesome. So mm -hmm. fun. Um, but so, yeah, so my, you know, my recent book soundtracks is about, you know, mindset essentially. And so companies will say, okay, usually mindset is a fuzzy, soft, holistic topic with no actions. And it's like, you, you just light a candle and cl clear your head, you know, like that's not helpful right. to a company. Right. So I'll go in and say, okay, wow, your sales team is trying to accomplish this. Here's how they can create new thoughts that'll help their new actions, which will turn into new results. So that's what I do. I would say half my year is writing ideas and the ideas might be on my own podcast. It might be a book. It might be a course I'm teaching. And then the other half of the year is I'm traveling around the country and in the world in a normal year, um, sharing these ideas, teaching these ideas um, to companies like Comedy Central or Microsoft or Nokia or Nissan or the NFL Players Association, whoever. Here's how you put these ideas in your life. And the other thing is that when you create a book like a finish, you talk about that for hopefully the rest of your life. Um, right. I try to write books that are applicable five years later, 10 years later, 20 years later, because there's been research and because they're not, you know, my books aren't, you know, okay, here's something political that happened yesterday. And it's, you know, the further we get away from that idea, the colder it is, they're much more focused on how could I talk about this idea and help people with that idea for 20 years. Right. Yeah. I think about like the, the books that have impacted me the most. In, in, you know, in, like you say, nonfiction kind of personal or professional development. And, and it is, yeah, it's books like, you know, Start With Why or oh, yeah. Outliers. They're tiny. Or The War of they're... Art, War of Art by Stephen Pressfield. Yeah, yeah, like, oh, so I read good. that 20 years ago so and good. it's yeah. still, I, I can still read it once a year and go, wow, I'm getting something out of this. So yeah, those are the kind of books that you aspire to. Definitely. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So, um, so let's talk about soundtracks. Um, sure. I love that you took on overthinking um as a as a as a topic and i remember you saying or i not remember you saying i remember reading when i was prepping for this interview reading about the basically you said overthinking is a really i don't remember exactly what you said but basically it's like a really insidious form of mm -hmm. fear totally like it's yeah, one it, of the creative mechanisms that our brain uses to bubble up fear you know as a wolf in sheep's in the in the clothing of overthinking right sure Sure. Um, yeah. So basically little, talk a little bit about that. Yeah. The idea was that sometimes people think it's a personality trait and it's not, it's the sneakiest, greediest form of fear because it steals time, creativity, productivity, diets, books. Um, and the definition I use is overthinking is when what you think gets in the way of what you want. So you want to start a podcast. You want to write a book. You want to get in shape. You want to ask the person out and then all these extra thoughts get in the way. Um, and so what, what was interesting was I commissioned a research study with a PhD named Mike Peasley. 
Um, and we asked 10,000 people if they struggle with overthinking and 99.5% of people said yes. Mm. And so it's one of those problems everybody has, but everybody thinks everybody else doesn't have, you know, it's only me, but then you start right. to look at the research and go, no, everybody is. And this was both, we did this research study before 2020, 2020 was catnip for overthinking. Yeah. Um, because now everything is a thing. I mean, think about 99% of your life, Jeff, you never had to question which aisle in which direction you walk down a grocery store. But right. now everything in life is a thing. We're all overthinking. And so that was what was really fun about the release of the book was that there's been a lot of people that have said, wow, I have been overthinking this like the last 18 months. What do I actually do with that? How do I, how do I change that? And again, you said it at the beginning of the episode, I try to write books that are actionable. Um, I don't, I don't like, I don't like 90% of the motivational stuff that's online because it's just empty. A lot of it's not true. A lot of it's not helpful. A lot of it makes you feel worse. I saw somebody the other day that said they get up at 2.45 a.m. to work out. And like, that's ridiculous. That's like, that's manic. That's not healthy. Like you shouldn't try to tell other moms they should get up at 2.40. Yeah. Like that's night, dude. That's not even kind of night. That's deep night. And so I try to position myself on the outside of that going, Here's something I tried. Here's something 10,000 people tried when we did the research. Here's what we found that worked. Here's things you can try in your own life and have hopefully similar results. That's how I think about overthinking. Hmm. Well, I, uh, I don't get up at 245, but I'm, def I'm feeling very, actually, I'm not feeling convicted at all because, so I get up at 330 every morning. That's still an hour and 15 after this other lady. She's killing you, dude. Uh, oh, I know. You should yeah, be. I, she's already done burpees by the time you're getting up. I, I mean, should gosh. be very, very ashamed. Of what myself. time do you go to bed? What time do you go to bed at night? Uh, I, I'm in bed. So actually, my wife and I have a like our hangout time is we're in bed by, mm -hmm. I'd say, eight o'clock. Yep. And so then and, you can hang out, talk. Catch yeah, up. yeah. And we usually yeah. will drift. I, I tend to sleep about five to five and a half hours a night mm -hmm. of actual sleep. I'm usually sure. asleep by 10 or 1030. Mm -hmm. Um, what do you do at three 30? Are you at gym and, first, first in the morning? Uh, yeah. So I get up at three 30 and I kind of do my, you know, I, I don't have like a formal meditation practice, but I definitely carve out like a solid five ten mm -hmm. for just visualization and, you know, sure. breathing and kind of stuff. Um, but yeah, I meet a trainer at the gym at four 30. Nice. So, I, so I you got some accountability. A, yeah. Yeah. So yeah. I, I give myself that hour to just, you know, prep for the day. Mm. Um, I'm at the gym by 4.30, work out for an hour. Then I go to, my, my office is five minutes from the gym. So then I drive to my oh, nice. office and I have a piano there and I practice piano for just shy of an hour every morning. Oh, that's gotta be so good for your brain, right? Yeah, yeah. So from 5.30, yeah. 5.40 to about 6.40, I'm playing piano, 6.30 mm -hmm. usually. Then I drive home and take my daughter to school um, mm -hmm. and we grab usually breakfast or a cake pop. She loves cake pops on the way. And then uh, I see my other daughter from 7.30 to 8. And then work typically starts at 8. So I actually get up that early because I literally have that much to do. Sure, sure, totally. Um, but How long but have you done that? You say How that. many years have you done that? Uh, I've been doing that for three, almost four years now. Three to four, years. Three, four okay. years. Nice. But it's interesting you said that because, you know, our brand director, whose name is Chelsea, she's like, Jeff, stop talking about your morning routine. You just make people feel bad. That's not no, what but I, that's but I think it's interesting when it, here's what I like about that. The reason I asked you how long you've done it is that it's real. What I don't like is when a lot of entrepreneurs, a lot of gurus, motivational mm -hmm. people, they try something once and they declare, this is the way I always do it. Or they right. try something for a week and they go, I always write on Tuesdays, every Tuesday I write. And you go, how many Tuesdays have you done it? One Tuesday. Right. Entrepreneurs, gurus are amazing at making announcements. Sometimes they're not amazing at sticking to actions. Right, so right. if you had told me, John, I've done this for the last two weeks, I'd be like, well, that that's not even a thing yet, dude. Like you've done it 12 times. Right, but when right. you go, I've done it for four years, that's different to me. But I would still argue 245 is an insane time to ask a mom to get up to work. Well, yeah, that's out. the thing. You got to find, and this is where, where, you know, you and Chelsea are right. And I've really, really softened because my, my attitude is like success is a, like, like real success, like pinnacle success where, you know, let's call it a top one to 5% result financially, personally, yeah, sure. uh, in terms of your health, in terms of the quality of your marriage, like to just have a great life across the major categories of life is a very rare achievement. Yeah. Right. And so if you want a very rare thing to have to be your truth and your reality, 
you're probably going to have to kind of live on the edge of what the average yeah. person considers to be extreme. You're going to have to do some rare things. Yeah. yeah. If you want rare and, results, you're going to have to have some rare actions. hundred percent agree. And so I, I've always been kind of hardcore or I say always, but I mean, my, my content and I've been an, I've been an educator, you know, and out there in the public now for the better part of four years. Mm -hmm. And I tend to be kind of extreme, but like they've kind of worked to soften me because, because what I realize is first and foremost, I should do no harm. And to, like you said, if, if sure. I have some mother who works a double shift, she works till midnight. And now she believes because she heard me say that I get up at three 30, that that's what it takes to be successful. Yeah. Her kids are going to suffer. Yeah. And that, and that's the thing that I think I, to the point of like, it's rare. I think it's rare. And it's also personal. Like you have to own your, like I, my life would suck if I tried to use somebody else's version of success as my definition. Yeah. I'm a terrible Gary V. I suck at being Jim Collins. Like I, but if I, I'm a pretty good John Acuff when I can hold on to that. So for my life, these are the decisions that make my life work for your life. Those are the decisions. I think the challenge is when it's tempting to say, if you do this exactly this way, here's what will happen. And I just don't think that's true because of the, there's some things, if you work out more than you don't work out, you get in better shape. I don't yeah. think anybody would argue that if you write more than other people, you end up with a book that's done. Like that's part of it. But right. I do think there's this temptation to go, here's the exact formula. And like my version of that is when people go, wow, you get a lot done and you have kids. It's true, but I have two teenage daughters. I have a sophomore and a senior. Like that's different than when you have a two-year-old and a four-year-old. When I had a two-year-old and a four-year-old, my weekends were different because we were right. raising intense children. Now my senior in high school, you know, Friday, she'll go to the high school band football game. She'll, she'll go to school at 6 a.m. in the morning. She'll come home that night at 11 p.m. So right. I'm not technically parenting that whole day. She's gone. She's doing her thing. It would be unfair for me to go just just have 12 hours of free time. Like if you have a two-year-old, they don't give you 12 hours of free yeah. time. And so that's the, that's the thing I always kind of push back against is when especially – young single men who are 24 tell you how to shape uh, your day like as if that is how everybody's day is and i think that there that's where some of this is like come on dude like give me a break where i like i'm i'm fine with you not softening it but i think you're sharing the real details I, here's with my daughter here's you would never tell somebody if you want to have this kind of life i have you got to play the piano an hour a day if you're not playing the piano an hour a day, like, what do you even do it? Like, that would be insane, dude. If you said, if you wrote a course on how to be successful and step three was you have to play the, that's a joy for you. That's a muscle. That's something you've loved for a long time. Like to release, like it keeps your brain sharp. Like that's such a gift. Somebody else's gift is going to be different. And that's both of those are awesome. Hey, sorry for the interruption. I just wanted to let you know, you can get a free copy of my book, The Millionaire Shortcut which shows you the fastest way to become a millionaire in the new economy. And there's a special link just for this episode in the description. So thanks for tuning in and I hope you enjoy the rest of the episode. So I, uh, I'm curious, you mentioned something that I love the way you said it. Like, you know, I suck at being Gary Vee. I suck at being Jim Collins. And I'm yeah. pretty, you know, on a good day, I'm a decent John Acuff, right? Yeah, totally. Um, and uh, yeah, I love, you reminded me of the Oscar Wilde quote, you know, just be yourself. Everyone else is taken. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm curious, like there's a concept we teach a lot in my world called your success character, which is, you know, there's, it's not a, not a new idea. I mean, uh, Freud called it your ego ideal, sure. um, but it's like this, this version of yourself where you really lean into your strengths, right? Like mm -hmm. I'm a big uh, positive psychology, like strength psychology guy. And you really like kind of cultivate and curate this version of yourself that really leans into your strengths, kind of, you know, try to delegate or outsource or, or just delete your weaknesses, whatever they mm -hmm. are. And like, kind of create this, like you said, on a good day, be the best version of yourself. Right. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious if you uh, have done any work or, or, and I feel like those of us that are in the self-improvement game, this is kind of what we do, right? Sure. We kind of try to use ourselves as this Guinea pig to like be as good as we can be so that we don't feel like a hypocrite telling other people at least, hopefully how to be better. Right. Totally, totally. So tell me about the difference between John's, let's call it your ego ideal, you know, the super John versus just like, just John. Oh yeah. So, I mean, for me, you know, to kind of put a pin in the getting up when I had two kids under the age of four and I was stuck at my job and I wanted to do something different. 
Um, I couldn't tell my wife on a Saturday, Hey, I'm going to spend the whole day just kind of working on myself. So like, if you could watch the kids, that'd be great. I came up with a concept that so many people have done this. It's not unique to me. I just said, I'm going to be selfish at 5. AM at 5. AM. People aren't asking me to do stuff mm -hmm. at 5. AM. My kids aren't up yet at 5. AM. I don't have other obligations. So I had to start getting up early. That's when I wrote my first book. Cause I had a full-time job. I had freelance clients. I had a small group I was in. I had a beautiful wife. I wanted to be connected to, I had two kids. So like the only time was to carve it out in the morning. So that's part of that. Like I want to be the kind of guy that gets up early and does the things before yeah. the world wakes up. Um, because I don't want to take away time from a Saturday because that's kids time. That's family time. So that's kind of the ideal. I mean, the, the one that's, you know, the natural, if we're at, you know, if we're saying ideal versus, you know, the one that's not ideal, I would say the one that's not ideal is when um, like I use somebody else's voice to write my stuff. I always tell people, it's not about finding your voice. It's about keeping your voice. Your voice is the most slippery object in the world. It's so easy to write in somebody else's voice. And so especially young authors, new authors will write something that sounds like somebody else. Cause you know, take Gary V as an example. If you don't swear in your natural life and you watch a Gary V video and then swear more, that's not authentic. That's right. you playing a version of Gary V. Like I did an event with Gary V. I was the opener. He was the closer. And somebody said, it was like watching Coldplay open up for Rage Against the Machine. And I thought that was hilarious. And I'll take that all day. Viva La Vida is a fantastic song. I don't care who you are. That song makes you happy. But like, that was perfect because that's authentic. He's authentically Gary V. Like off stage, on stage, he's authentically himself. If I tried to do what he did, I would be playing a version of somebody else. So for me, having what I'd call a full cup wife, a wife who is full of truth and is brave enough to go like <clears throat> she did four years ago, four years ago, she was like, Hey, you're a jerk for the two years when you write a book and you're a jerk for the two years when you sell a book. And that's not going to work for me. Like that doesn't work for us. I'd rather you be a happy plumber than a miserable writer. And what she was saying is that I had this broken soundtrack. We're talking about soundtracks today where 12 years ago, I had an ad agency that failed and I had to save the day. And I learned I can function in a crisis, which is a good thing to know. I can function in a crisis. Yeah. But then over time that deteriorated into, I function best in a crisis. And over time that deteriorated further into, I need a crisis to function. And now I was the kind of leader that was great at putting out fires. And when there weren't fires, I had to stir them up. And so in order to do some big project, I had to create stress and chaos and crisis and stir up all these. I was miserable to be around. And there's a lot of leaders that do that. A lot of entrepreneurs I work with have the most chaotic lives and they don't need to. And if you talk to them, they're like, I'm running and gunning. And then you see the trail of bodies in their background where it's like 10 divorces, kids that don't talk to them anymore, all mm -hmm. this kind of emotional wreckage. And so you go, well, that's a bad fuel crisis is a bad fuel. Like stress is a bad fuel. Like it's a good short-term fuel. Don't get me wrong. It's allowed me to accomplish some stuff, but long-term it burns you out trying to prove yourself to somebody else. Good short-term fuel, terrible long-term fuel. So that's the kind of stuff I think about. So I look at it and go, I'm in ideal when I'm not using chaos as a fuel. I'm in ideal when I'm not using cortisol as a fuel. When I don't need a deadline and the white hot fire of a deadline to inspire me, but I can see it far ahead and I can take the steps to get there. Man, good, uh, good self-awareness. It's weird for you to be self-aware about me. That's actually kind of, cool. <laughs> yeah, that's, well, that's cause we write, I mean, like that, <laughs> like when you, I know, like if we got together, like if I was in Vegas, like we would nerd out on all these topics, like, so dude, true. we would, we would have so much fun talking through all this stuff. Like, so that's why podcasts like this feel fun. Cause there's a conversation about stuff that, we like to talk about, it, and then we like to help other people figure out in their own lives. So I, I feel like we're in the same spot. Yeah, no, it's so funny, man. Last, uh, last month. So our company, I'll, I'll share a little bit. Um, you know, we're entrepreneurial education company and we sell, you know, thousands of courses, people yeah, totally. wanting to learn to start businesses or whatever, um, you know, side hustle, whatever. But we do, you know, what I figured out really quick is that if you're going to be in the entrepreneurial development business, you're just as much in the personal development business as you are in the professional development. Totally. Like, totally. Entrepreneurship is about here and here before it's ever out here. Right. Yeah. And, um, and I guess if you're listening to this, I pointed to head and heart and then hands that didn't, if they, I know that was one. a radio moment. Like you just did a magic trick on a radio show. Yeah. Right? Yeah. You exactly. always have to go, wait a second. Hold on. Uh, so um, anyways, but 
but yeah, we figured out, oh, this, this basically, we need to do personal development. So, uh, and I've always been real into it, but we actually partnered up with um, one of the really long standing guy who's been a personal development lead facilitator for one of the biggest personal growth companies in the world for like 20 years and built our own personal development curriculum. We have these big events and everything. And uh, anyways, I went to one last month. It was our first event that we did of this particular workshop. And I went to one and I figured out kind of what you just said, which is, oh my gosh, I have this stupid game that I, pl I have played for years mm -hmm. where I get everything up to a certain point and then I like burn it all down to the ground and create yeah. all this chaos and like bullets are flying. And then I heroically save the day by <laughs> digging out of my own self-created chaos. Yeah. And I look like this hero who can overcome anything. And it's like, well, yeah, no shit. You set all that stuff in motion just so you could overcome it and look like a <laughs> yeah. badass. Yeah, Why don't exactly. you just not create the problems in the first place? Yeah. Yeah. Which is easy to say, but then like when you're in the middle of it, it's hard to go, wait a second, wait a second, wait a second. Well, and I would get all these people clapping for me. Sure. Sure. Like, who doesn't oh, like clap you, you paid off half a million dollars in debt as an affiliate market. Like that was my story for years. I was like yeah. this rap, you know, rapid rise internet marketer who paid off all this debt, but like, yeah, but opening those two restaurants that created all that debt was yeah. the literal stupidest idea that a human <laughs> being ever had. And it's so like, funny. I did it knowing it would that's fail. That's so funny. That's so. so funny. Yeah, well, so that's the stuff like, for me, it's a work in progress. So I'm not like, I look at it and go, okay, I don't like, you develop self-awareness. Um, and you also like, I think a hundred percent self-awareness is a myth. We need people in our life, like a spouse, like a mm -hmm. friend, like an accountability partner who go, Whoa, wait, wait a second. You said this, you're doing the opposite. Like you said this, this is what's really happening. It's kind of like, if you've ever been in a bad relationship, a dating relationship, it's like, you're so close to the painting. You can't tell what the painting is. And you have oh, friends yeah. on the outside that can actually see it. And when you break up and you get removed from it, you go, wow, that was really terrible. Why did I let that happen? And your friends will go, well, we tried to let you know. And so I think that's part of it too, is there's self-awareness, but there's also um, emotional vulnerability where you have people in your life who can tell you the truth. And what I've yeah. learned about leaders over the years is that leaders who can't be questioned end up doing questionable things. So show me an entrepreneur that fell, show me a church that fell, show me a, a business that fell. I'll show you a leader who is isolated and could only be told the things they wanted to hear. And it's the emperor mm -hmm. news clothing where you go, oh, no wonder they got into that place. They, you know, people had to clap in the boardroom and they told the truth in the break room. And you never want that as a mm -hmm. leader where the experience is different, where people have to go, this is going to be great. And then in the break room, they go, somebody should tell him, somebody should tell her and nobody will. And that's, that's where a scary place as an entrepreneur, as an individual. Um, so that's why we need people in our life, like a spouse, like a friend that'll go, Hey, hey, wait a second. I think this is broken. Like, let's talk through it. Yeah, no, that's so true. Um, yeah, I appreciate all the stuff you're saying. It gives me so much food for thought, really like go back and make sure I have my, I mean, and I do, I have wonderfully honest people in, in my life, like yourself, start first and foremost, my wife. Um, and I, I will say this, and, and Jacqueline, if you ever hear this, I mean this, and I've said this to you privately, I have learned, despite many attempts to resist the learning this lesson, I have learned to just trust her damn intuition. Mm -hmm. It is just so much better than mine. <laughs> yeah. 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 It's so like my wife's discernment and I, uh, I always joke that one of my goals in marriage is to shorten the distance between when my wife tells me something and I believe it's true and I act on it. Like Ooh. when we were first married, yeah, yeah. it was like two weeks of me being grumpy. I'd be like, well, I don't know what you're talking about. And now we've gotten, a, you know, we've gotten it closer where she'll tell me something. I'll go, I'm going to think about that. And I'll come back an hour later and go, that was brilliant. I mean, what every spouse hates, and this goes both, both directions is when they've told you something for years and a random person tells you and you come oh. home and go, oh, listen to this thing this person said. And they're like, I've been trying to get you to stop doing that for five years. A dude at the bar said it. And now you're like, right. so I, I think every spouse goes through some degree of that. But it's awesome to have a spouse that, you know, pushes with you, encourages you, challenges you, loves you, you know, um, likes you enough to tell you things that are hard to say. There's all these things that a great spouse is really a big gift. Yeah, it's interesting that the person that is closest to us knows us the best and whom we 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 basically contractually agreed agreed to put the most faith in via yeah. a lifelong covenant. Totally, totally. In front of lots of people. 
that person often becomes the person that we are the least interested in what they have to say. I mean, you see that in a lot of marriage. It's oh, like- totally, totally. And, and, you know, that's super sad. And I think it's part of what happens, you know, in relationships. But for me, uh, my wife is, she's not my secret weapon. Cause I talk about her constantly. Yeah. Like it's not a secret. Um, you know, I, there's things I, you know, like she said to me one day, she was like, Hey, stop saying you have haters. I was like, what do you mean? She was like, well, you don't have a ton of people who are actively spending their whole day hating on you. You like to say it because it makes you feel important. So it's really an ego statement, not a truth statement. I was like, son of a, and she, <laughs> and she was right. And you go like, dude, I don't have 50 haters. Like I had one grumpy person on the internet. Like the president has haters. Like the prime minister has haters. I have five grumpy people that, you know, said something years ago that I'm still going, man, you got to fight through the haters, like get over yourself. (laughs) And so like, she'll tell me stuff like that. I'm like, oh, dang, that is good. And I need to listen to that. So thank goodness for spouses like that. That's pretty funny. That's yeah, that's funny. As somebody who occasionally goes off about his haters, you just gave me food for thought. Thank your wife for me. Thank you for. Well, how long do you, uh, how long have you been married? Oh, I've been married uh, 6, 8, 12. So 2012, we got married. Oh, nice. Nice. Yeah. So going on 10 almost. Next year yeah, is yeah. 10. Approaching awesome. 10, yeah. Very cool. Congrats. Yeah, thank you. No, it's it's great. How about you? Uh, 20, 20 years. Yeah, 20 years 20 now. Years. 2001. Um, so first, we just did... first wife? Yeah, yeah. Totally. Nice. Totally. Nice. Yeah, right. Uh, we met first job. I was a copywriter as I said yeah, earlier. Yeah. Um, and she was, she was an intern. And so we worked at an ad agency on a project together and that was kind of how it started, but she has her undergrad in photojournalism and her master's in construction management. So she's just this brilliant. She runs half the company now. So she stays home with the kids and, and edits books, like keeps me on track, tells me when something is fake and not real. And so, yeah, she's the, the more I listen to her, the easier and more fun life is. Nice. Well, uh, congrats on making that first marriage work. I cannot say the same for myself, but uh, I like to think that I learned a lot and I've brought it into my current successful. Totally. Marriage, so, you know, um, question for you, though. So you've succeeded as a writer mm-hmm. and you have succeeded as a speaker. And these are two things that there are a lot of people that want to do. I, I know like I talk to I because I get messages on Instagram from people that are like telling me their hopes and dreams. Right. And I can tell you a lot of people want to write books. And a lot of people want to be public speakers, even though supposedly that's one of our greatest human fears. There are a lot of people that want to do it. They're both incredibly hard fields to be really successful at. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm curious, you've shared a little bit about uh, the book stuff, and I love how organically that got that started. And I suspect that's a big part of why you've done so well at it is that it grew out of, like you said, your passion, but also something that you... uh, you didn't just, just, you know, decide one day I'm going to write a book and become a writer. Yeah. Like you were, you were right. already writing. Totally. Back. Totally. Um, I was a professional writer. Speaking. Yeah. Talk so speaking, speaking for me, yeah, how'd you get into that at a, at a professional level? Yeah. So, I mean, I had the good fortune of growing up with a pastor as a dad. So mm. I saw somebody speak for a living. So it wasn't weird to me. Like gotcha. I knew like, Oh, you can get on stage. You can say words. Um, but that's not the same thing as corporate business speaking, which is what I do. Um, so Again, I really, that first time somebody asked me to speak, I went, I didn't even know you got paid for it. I was terrible. Like it was just like the speech had too many main points. I was just an amateur at it. One of the things I always tell people is be brave enough to be bad at something new or be brave enough to suck at something new. And so it was new. And so I had to work at it. And so then a big part of it for me has been about the prep. Like I think speaking changed for me when I I changed it from an act of performance to an act of service. Like I'm there to serve the audience. I'm there to serve the CEO. I, you know, I'm there to serve the event planner. The event planner at a company is there all year. I'm there for an hour. So I'm there to make, like, I want her to win. I want him to win. Like mm-hmm. I always say, like some of my goals when I give a speech are, I want the sound guy laughing because the sound guy has heard everything. The dude at the JW Marriott that's on staff running events has heard every boring keynote. If that guy is laughing, I've killed the room. That's one of my goals. Another goal is I want the event planner to be getting text messages during my keynote from people going, oh, I'm so glad you hired this guy. He gets it. So a lot of that starts with prep. Like I have a series of questions. I do a client call before. So when I'm doing a speech, I'm trying to have empathy for the audience to know, okay, 
I know they just went through this tough situation. You know, I know, okay, for instance, when I talk to property managers, I know the government over the last 18 months spent a lot of time telling us how evil property managers are. They just want to evict people. They're terrible. So if I can speak to that with empathy, they go, wow, he came in with a message for me. Where people don't like is when they can get a sense that you're using stock photography in essence. Like you have one yeah. speech. Doesn't matter if you're mom bloggers. Doesn't matter if you work for Nissan. Doesn't matter if you're a property manager. This is the speech you're getting. And so customizing it, caring about the audience, trying to see that it's an act of service, not just performance. And then developing humor for me has been a big part of it. Realizing that's my space. Like that's where, you know, if I can lean in with humor and I believe what Chris Rock says, which is sometimes people won't listen unless they're laughing at the same time. And so I use humor as a vehicle for truth. So if I can take a challenging idea, figure out some humor to deliver it with, then I get people to listen in a different way than if I just show up and go, here's the seven things you need to do, or here's the three things you need to do. And it's really fun for me. And it's really fun for the audience. And I, I think it's the best job in the world. I can't believe I get to do it. I'm so grateful that I do. I did a virtual event this morning um, for a big healthcare company. And so here's an example of that. So I, I had spoken to this company two years before. It was a group of CEOs for hospitals. And I told this story where I basically said, it's hard to be the CEO of a hospital because you don't get to say two sentences. Everybody else gets to say the sentence. It's not life or death and it's not brain surgery. If you're the CEO of a hospital, it is. So that's kind of funny. But then I go, and your job range, your, your range of responsibilities goes from saving someone's life to people are furious, it's Pepsi in the vending machine. Saving someone's life to they don't like your parking lot and they gave you a bad review on Yelp where they usually rate burritos, but now they're rating your whole hospital. And every CEO goes of a hospital goes, oh, okay, that's true. Like that's what our job is like. And right. so it creates this connection and it honors them because I've done the upfront work to come up with real examples that they can go, oh, that's, that's so true. Like I've been in that situation before. Or if I speak to dentists, I can say, you know, um, you have to wear a lot of hats because people will tell you things in a dental chair they shouldn't tell you. Like people will talk about their marriage in a way that you're like, I just want you to floss more. Um, this is all of a sudden you're laying down. So you think it's therapy. I just right. want you to use more floss and you have to be prepared as a dental hygienist. And so if I can do that kind of thing. It changes my experience with an audience and it, and they feel super served. Man, that's so, so cool. You know, we live in that era. Everything, everybody says now in, in the modern world, you can't be, you can't do business that doesn't feel personal. Like business, yeah. we live in the area where the customer expects something that feels bespoke or, or oh, totally tailored somehow. So it's that's what you're basically describing is 100%. And then I'm enjoying it. I'm having fun. I'm practicing it. I mean, I, I do so many reps for a speech, you know, like, and I, I've learned over the years, I want it to be 90% planned, 10% magical. And the 10% mm -hmm. is something that happens for the first time on stage for both of you. An audience can feel that. And sometimes it's, there's a loud noise in the, in the room and you do something about it. Sometimes it's somebody's phone goes off. Sometimes it's you've just talked to the CEO right before you step on stage and you reference that, or there was somebody that said right. something, you know, right before. And so I, that's, you know, so I plan, I know where I'm going, the slides, like, I think one of the greatest mistakes speakers make is they design their own slides. You suck at designing slides. Unless you're a designer, you're terrible at that. Like hire, it's worth that. If you're going to give a speech for an entire year, it's worth the $300 to find a designer. And I only, I only put, you know, I only put statements on my slides that I would tweet. They have to be sticky enough that I'd actually tweet them. So like when I teach empathy, I say, how do you have empathy? You read less minds, ask more questions, read less minds, ask more questions. And then I go, and then I know people in the crowd are going to be like, well, it should be fewer minds. So I go and real quick, grammatically, it should be fewer minds, but less was a better rhythm and rhythm is a dancer. So I went with less. And so now I've identified somebody's thought. I've changed it with a joke and I'm moving on. And then I go, okay, hey, here's how you do that. And here's how I learned that at Bose. And here's a joke from a Dr. Dre lyric. And it goes back to what did I say about creativity? Wild mind, disciplined eye. So now I've got seven things connected in a thread that you haven't seen yeah. before. And then like the Dr. Dre line, I know 10% of the audience is going to get it and they're going to really get it. The 90% 90 other, 90 of the other people, if they don't get it, it's so fast, they don't feel like they missed something. So yeah. they're not on the outside of a private joke, but the 10% are like, what did he just say that related to electronics? And you know, like told that story. So that's kind of, for me, that's what I'm threading together. Man, a lot of preparation as somebody who's 
spoken, but not done as much as I'd like to do. I really, really respect the the level of preparation you're talking about and 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 conscientious preparation, creative preparation, not just knowing your facts. So to speak. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, that's the thing. Like you want to do the talk, you want to talk to the client a month before and you want to I have a set of questions I ask them. And I want to, you know, and I'm list, that's the first speech. I'm doing two speeches. The first speech is the phone call where right. I'm learning and I'm learning and I'm, I'm engaging. And then I want to show up and them to go, oh, he listened. Like that was, he yeah. threaded it in that idea. And he, you know, like, um, like today when, when I spoke to the healthcare company, one of their soundtracks is care like family. So I mentioned care like family in my talk about soundtracks. And so that tells everybody there, okay. He did some research. It tells the mm -hmm. event planner, I care. So yeah, that to me is really, really fun. And the other thing is the bar is sometimes like there's, there's great speakers, but sometimes they've got huge egos. They show up and they're demanding. And so like anytime a speaker demands something, it makes my job easier because I yeah. show up and I have fun and I super serve the audience. And then they go out. Oh, that was really fun. We should book him again. Versus if you show up with an attitude of you're lucky to have me, um, I'm only going to be here for 10 minutes. I'm going to do what I always do. I don't want any additional prep. Like if you show up with that attitude, they can tell the audience can tell and they'll, they'll shut you down or old school speakers, old school leaders used to believe if I share my weaknesses, people won't trust my strengths. Mm -hmm. New school is if I pretend I don't have weaknesses, people won't trust my strengths. So when I tell a story like, okay, I spoke at the FedEx corporate headquarters and they ordered a book for everybody, which was amazing. And then my publisher sent me the email with the tracking link and it was a UPS tracking link. Like the crowd groans. And I tell the story of like, yeah, it was embarrassing that I UPS books to the FedEx corporate headquarters. A brown truck had to pull up to the FedEx security gate and yeah. say, hey, I got some John Acuff books. He's a business expert. Where should I deliver them? I'm not familiar with your campus. That's a funny story. And it it's a story where I made a mistake and it was embarrassing, but it's also relatable. So like yeah. if... When a speaker, when you see somebody and all they tell you about is here's the famous people I know, or here's all my wins. Like I can't relate to that. There's a gap that opens up between the audience and the, and the stage. And your job as a speaker is to close that gap. There's a natural gap. You're, you're often six feet above them physically. Right. So your job is to close that gap, close that gap, close that gap. And if you can, then I think you have a better connection. So final question, only because yeah. we're out of time. And I hope we do get to have that time someday when we can just riff nerd out, hours on, nerd out on personal development. Yeah, exactly. Um, for, for somebody who wants to break in to speaking, mm -hmm. I'm curious. And I'm not asking for myself because I have my own. I'm, I'm saying the average person out there who's like, because I, I, I know I hear from people like, I want to be a public speaker. And the number one thing I always hear from people is I really want to just inspire people. Sure. That's it. But like, you can't just call up an agent and be like, I really want to inspire people. Can yeah. you get me a room? Right. Do yeah. you have any, any guidance for anybody that actually wants to break into that world? Sure. I always tell people, if you want to be a speaker, do people know you're speaking? Um, if they don't know you do that, they can't book you. So do you have a website? Are you creating content? Are you, you know, like, how would I even know you're a speaker? If you don't have mm -hmm. those things, it'd be like saying, I just want people to knock on my front door and say, hey, do you speak? Like, that's not how it happens. You get speeches by being in the marketplace. Like right. you get events by being at the marketplace. The second thing I'd say, I love, there's a guy named Grant Baldwin who writes about becoming spe a speaker. He has courses. I think he's great. The third thing I'd say is that if you get a gig, if you get a paying gig and you want to work with a speaker's bureau, I work with a speaker's bureau. They're awesome. Bring them that gig. Nothing opens the door with a speaker's bureau. Like if you say you have a gig and somebody's paying you $500 and you go, Hey, I'd love you to help me manage this. Would you help me? Like you're bringing them an already offer versus going, everyone else is emailing them going, I'm awesome. I'm passionate about speaking. I want to inspire people. They get a hundred emails like that a day. But right. if you go, you know what? They're going to take 20% of this and I'm willing to pay that 20%, even though maybe I could earn it, might keep it all myself, but I want them to know I'm generous. I'm all in. I want to be represented by a bureau. Like if you open the conversation with a deal, then they go, Oh, okay. Like who, what agent doesn't want a deal right. brought to them? That's awesome. And so for me, that's one of those small things that I think if more people did, they'd get more exposure to agents. Brilliant. Brilliant. Uh, you heard it here, folks, How to Break Into Speaking by John Acuff. So, John, uh, since we're out of time, tell the audience how they can go get more of your awesomeness, social media, sure. websites, offers, yeah, totally. courses, books, whatever. 
Yeah. Well, my podcast is called all it takes is a goal. Um, if I was going to listen to one episode, it either be Colleen Barry who lost her job with the dot com bust was a secretary, figured out how to change her mindset. And now she's the CEO of that company. It's a really amazing story. Mm. Or Greg Sankey. I interviewed Greg Sankey, who's the SEC commissioner of football, not securities, about what it was like to lead through COVID because the entire world of sports was watching the SEC to see what they're going to do. And he's this amazing leader. Um, If you want to read the first chapter of my book, Soundtrack, soundtracksbook.com. And then I'm on, you know, Twitter, Twitter, Instagram, I'm all over the place. So you can find me at John Aiko. If you loved that episode, then you're definitely gonna love this one. Check it out. The key to having your dreams come true, as tried as that sounds, is the ability to persuade others to a certain position or viewpoint. And I just tack on top of that to ethically persuade others.